I'm going to put my bias right on the table right now. This week's readings, which were labeled visual rhetoric theory and analysis and research, date all the way back to, oh, 2001. Wait, 2001? Yes, because for the purpose of putting brackets around this week's focus, I'm going to limit my focus on digital visual rhetorics. That is, the ways in which digital spaces, places, and tools have transformed our visual landscape. Otherwise, we could spend months, if not years, together studying petroglyphs, illuminated manuscripts, and centuries worth of mark-making means. Now, that doesn't mean that you should necessarily limit your focus as you think about your work for the class or the project you want to work on um, to the last 10 or 15 years, but it just means for this week and this video, I'm going to kind of anchor us to digital visual rhetorics. In this video, I'm going to introduce five themes and then invite you guys to articulate a theme you've experienced thus far in the readings. The first theme I want to point out is the role of new technologies. So let's start back in 1999. In a piece published in College Composition and Communication, Chris Anson described the ways in which the challenges of electronic media have been separate and discrete. And in 1999, this was very much the case. Different software was required to work with audio, with video, with graphics. The clunky first version of iMovie came out in late 1999, um, but didn't really come into common use until it was bundled with iLife in 2003. Back then, though, even if you could create movies, there really wasn't much you could do with them because it was hard to share and send them, especially if they were large files. YouTube didn't launch live until 2005. In one of the most important books written on multimedia, J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin describe the ways in which remediation happens, where new media refashion old media to fill a gap. And those gaps weren't typically just media gaps or technology gaps, they were also often social and cultural. I really like how the National Council of Teachers of English described this context on the website for the National Gallery of Writing, established to help celebrate the National Day on Writing, October 20th. Whether we call it texting, IMing, jotting a note, writing a letter, posting an email, blogging, making a video, building an electronic presentation, composing a memo, keeping a diary, or just pulling together a report, Americans are writing like never before. Recent research suggests that writing in its many forms has become a daily practice for millions of Americans. It may be the quintessential 21st century skill. Understanding who writes, when, how, to whom, and for what purposes will lead to production of improved resources for writers, better strategies to nurture and celebrate writers, and improved policy to support writing. So maybe this is all a bit fuzzy right now. We have the role of new technologies, digital visual rhetoric, writing, composing, new media. Let's look at some specific examples of the role of new technologies and how they inform or shape digital visual rhetorics. You've probably heard of this little website called Facebook. It's populated by more than 900 million active users, more than 80% of whom live outside the U.S. These users share more than 300 million photos every day on the site, designing and creating in an interesting space that Kristen Arla carefully analyzes in her piece on Web 2.0 interfaces. LiveJournal is home to more than 50 million journals and communities. More than 125,000 posts have been made in the last 24 hours. LiveJournal is one of the oldest blogging platforms in existence since 1999. It's open source and volunteer supported. Twitter launched in 2006. This is the main reading room at the Library of Congress. In April 2010, the LOC announced that it would begin archiving all public tweets. In April 2010, when this announcement was made, there are about 50 million tweets a day. In November 2011, there were more than 140 tweets a day. In March 2012, Twitter celebrated its sixth birthday and averaged 340 million tweets per day. The LOC is the terabytes, but is still working on the digital infrastructure to sort and archive all this material in a meaningful way. On Flickr, users share photos, add tags, compose comments, and collaborate on building clusters and pools and albums. A search for writing returns more than 2.6 million 
shared items. And that leads us nicely, I think, into theme two, the prevalence and importance of collaboration in digital space, especially where digital visual rhetoric is concerned. Jim Porter put it quite eloquently, collaboration is what's really key to new technologies. The computer itself isn't particularly revolutionary. What is revolutionary is the networked computer and the connections we can build with it. Jason Palmieri, in the epilogue we read, talks about collaboration writ large in our work and in our institutions. He describes our need to connect to allied fields, to work across disciplines, to engage in large-scale partnerships, and to work across our curriculum and beyond. In a piece a group of us wrote back in 2005, we argued collaboration is perhaps the most significant impact of computer technologies on the context and practices of writing. Writing teachers talk about collaboration, we talk about authentic audiences. Computer spaces and networks allow us access to collaborative writing spaces and to authentic audiences in ways we haven't had access to before. I don't want to sound too utopic. Of course there are pros and cons and potentials and pitfalls, and digital networks in and of themselves aren't going to offer us much. It's how we engage them. Okay, a few examples of collaboration. They're silly, but compelling, I think. On the Cheeseburger Network, thousands of people caption pictures of cats every day and respond to caption pictures of cats and have conversations about caption pictures of cats and celebrate a community formed around captioned pictures of cats. Hundreds of people contributed to the Lolcat Bible, a translation of the Bible into Lolcat speak. Blessings of the ceiling cat be upon you, seriously. And we begin with Genesis, book one. Oh, hi. In the beginning, ceiling cat made a disguise into earth's, but he did not eat a dumb. The earth's had no shapes and had a dark face, and ceiling cat rolled invisible bike over the waters. Is this part of that undercurrent Cirque describes? The powerful alternative forms and possibilities? The genres of public discourse? Theme three, pastiche, parody, and play. These three things are inherently connected, but I like connecting them. Let me quickly define them. Pastiche is kind of a hodgepodge of work derived from bits and pieces of other work. I think of it much like bricolage, the act of appropriating cultural bits and pieces and twisting their meaning to make new meaning. Cindy Self and Dickie Self draw from Turkle and Papert, who draw from Claude Levi Strauss to talk about meaning making through bricolage, the arrangement and rearrangement of materials, often in an intuitive rather than logical manner. Bricoleurs form a connection with a subject by physical and manipulative interaction. Often, the fuel for this taking and appropriating is parody. That is, to spoof or imitate a work in order to mock or comment upon it. Think about one of the examples from last week, the Pepsi iTunes ad and the parody of it. And the third part here is play. I tie pastiche, parody, and play together because I don't know how you can actually engage in pastiche without room for play. I don't know how you can create good parody without play. I take play very seriously. Here's an example of a very serious bit of playfulness. Congratulations! It's the late age of print, and technology is moving in a gingerly sprint. You're off and away in the digital place, a transformed and reformulated writing space. But one thing is important before we've begun. Let us never forget that our writing is fun. We're composing and creating and playing and poking, remixing, reworking, appropriating, and choking. We're expressing an image and text and in sound, and we're spreading rhetorical knowledge around. You're on your way to places both familiar and new, and learning various digital versions of you. And you'll love it, sometimes hate it, but you'll find it's quite true. There are so many places to go. Some interfaces will be complex and trite, and you'll toil all day and you'll toil all night. But remember, have fun, and you can't really break it. The machine has no feelings. Get mad. It can take it. Before too long, you'll record sound and bend it and shape it. Take an image, recolor, remix, and remake it. Put your face in a window, and what might you see? Could it be, could it be, a remediated version of me? Can I paint and contrast, remove and retrace? Find the blemishes and perfections I want to erase? Can I completely reimagine my face? Oh, the places this could go. You might encounter flash and run away in fright. Trust me, you can learn it, but not overnight. You might need a book to help bring things to light. Or Google, yes, Google, and try 
try till you get it right. And sometimes I'm afraid you will render and wait, or will download and install, and without debate, you will find that these technologies are wonderful for composing, but there are limitations worth hearing exposing. Don't wait, don't debate, save your work, work ahead, back up files, and stay mellow. Don't live in permanent dread. Digital mediums allow for all sorts of surprises, like unintentionally acquired skeleton disguises, and people who randomly turn you into a ninja who does the Macarena, and who am I kidding? Nothing rhymes with ninja. <laughs> The net will allow you to meet people who, just like you, are always looking for something to do. It might be something old, it might be something new. What it might be for you, I haven't a clue. You'll join new communities and become integrated, and you'll love that your hobbies are all concentrated into spaces and places that can be user-rated, and tagged and browsed and databased and conflated. Oh, the places you'll go. You might want to live a virtual second life, take on a virtual business, a virtual husband or wife. You might design clothes from prims or do something that's strange to earn yourself a chunk of that lend-in economy change. Remember, you're composing in the digital age. And sometimes when working with digital media, you'll fall and you'll fall and you'll fall and you'll fall and you'll fall. You're still falling, but remember the falling and all. But you'll land and get up and go on. Have a ball. Oh, the digital identities you might forge. <laughs> You might find yourself surfing to someone's blog or web page. They are both quite familiar in this digital age. You might even be sucked into the digital rage and composed in networked, interconnected, hypertextual ways. Then to MySpace and Facebook, with time as your chum, you'll be a vampire, a zombie, a Sith, or a bum. You'll rate people and professors in purity and song, favorite movies and books, post to walls all night long. You might make like a tourist and swap digital gender. It might not be fair. It might be a mind bender. Like me, you might play an elf, a horde defender, with a cat and an axe and a guild to consider. And while doing all this, you will learn to compose, in spite of the fact that it isn't five-paragraph prose. You'll see audiences, agency, intention, and theme. Create topoi and outlines and images and dreams. You'll write like you think and compose like you would if the page were not the only thing that we understood. It's a digital world in a digital time, and the digital end of a digital rhyme. Oh, the places will go. I have a few more examples of um, pastiche and parody specifically that I'll continue with um, at the start of the next video. So continue on with part two.